Well, if you guys haven't already seen it, uh, famous value investor Jeremy Grantham put out his annual letter that he always puts out. And what he sees is three and a half super bubbles. Now we're going to be getting into that today and kind of what his view of the market is. I really do think it's important that we're paying attention to a lot of these bigger players who, you know, they've been in the market for a long time. And as someone who's new or someone that's just come in the market, or maybe you've only been in for a couple of years, it's important that you understand the macroeconomic environment that we're operating within and just sort of how to play this. So we're going to dive right into it. I'm going to pull out the iPad and we're going to hop right into it. So stay tuned, make sure to like and subscribe. Let's get into this. All right, so I grabbed the iPad. We're gonna just kind of go over some of the key parts in the letter that I found, um, and we're just gonna kind of talk it through. Now, the first things first, his sort of executive summary of this entire letter is really, all two Sigma equity bubbles in developed countries have broken back to trend, but before they did, a handful went on to become super bubbles of three Sigma or greater in the US in 1929 and in the 2000 and in Japan in 1989. Now, there were also super bubbles in housing in 2006 and in Japan in 1989. All five of these super bubbles corrected all the way back to trend with much greater and longer pain than average. Today in the US, we are in the fourth super bubble of the last 100 years. Previous equity super bubbles had a series of distinct features that individually are rare and collectively are unique to these events. In each case, these shared characteristics have already occurred in this cycle. The checklist for a super bubble running through its phases is now complete and the wild rumpus can begin at any time. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read something like that, when I read someone that has billions and billions of dollars managed in assets under management, that is very concerning to me. I, I, I read through the letter and I couldn't think of a better way of kind of summarizing how I have felt about the market. So I think it's important though, that we kind of go into why. And a big component of this is going to be, um, sort of broken down into a couple of parts. Now, one thing that I did want to mention is the margin debt that we currently see in the market. Now you can see that there's two lines. One has the S&P 500 market cap, and then the other is the margin debt. And you can see how well correlated they are. Now, the crazy thing you would think, and if you're gonna ever get into margin debt as a way of investing, uh, make sure you do so in a very conservative manner. Don't bet on things that are high flyers. Don't put all your money in at the top of a market. And again, that's easier said than done. You can see that here, that every single time that we've had a downturn or some sort of pullback or correction, margin debt has been pulled off. And that's kind of the overarching theme you'll see in a lot of other value investors items is that a lot of the growth we've seen over the last 10 years has really been because of buybacks and people taking out leverage to increase their investment into equities. And it's almost like playing musical chairs and you're just hoping that you're the one who can grab the chair at the last moment and you're not going to be the one stuck holding the bag. So that's why I think that overall the super bubble really is something that we should be worried about and something we should pay attention to. Now, one thing I also wanted to point out, and this is an exhibit from his... Um, from his letter, the first exhibit that I just showed you actually came from Yardini Research. They have a lot of good content there. But the second one I wanted to show you, he was explaining how every single bubble we've seen in terms of equity has had this huge, um, basically blow off tops. And basically what that means is that we reach a peak at some point and suddenly everything comes crashing back down. Because one of the things you have to pay attention to is as we get to crazier and crazier and crazier valuations, the odds of it coming crashing back down versus shooting back up, it's not the same. It's not a 50-50% probability. As we get higher and higher and farther and farther above that value trend, you're gonna be seeing more and more and more risk. And that's what I think a lot of investors aren't paying attention to today. There is real, there is nominal returns, there's real returns, and there's risk adjusted returns. And a lot of these people are putting their money into speculative assets that are considered growth stocks that aren't making any money, they're not cash flowing, and they're making it a big proportion of their portfolio. Now, if you're, I'm not here to argue about not having earnings or anything like that. Some people believe in it, some people don't, I understand that, but it is something that you wanna note that in, in times like these, where we're gonna have rate hikes, we're gonna have things that change the macroeconomics, the first companies to go are the ones that are highly valued. 
the slow growing, boring companies, those are the ones that tend to, you don't have as much downside, but also the upside is very slow and creeping. And I'll include, um, and I just looked at the chart today. We had an ARC fund versus Berkshire Hathaway A shares. And you can see that Berkshire performed better over the last three years. And obviously, ARC went up crazy, but a lot of people like to think, oh, I'll just sell at the top when it's a 250% or whatever, I'll sell then. But there's a lot of people that don't. And on top of that, there's a lot of people who buy at the top and then ride it all the way down. So that's why when you're getting into companies, make sure you truly believe in the economics of the company and make sure it's a cash flowing company. So that way you can do well. Now, next, Jeremy Grantham says that this is a three sigma event and that three and a half asset classes are in super bubbles. The three that he believes are in actual super bubbles is stocks, bonds, and housing with commodities as a half. Now, stocks and bonds, obviously, I don't think I really need to go into this too much. And again, if you want to go into kind of his thoughts on it, you can dive into the letter and really truly read it. But one of the things that he was saying is just how highly leveraged and how high we have grown over the last couple of years, really over the last 10 years, and how we've gotten to this point. Um, he said, the key here is that two things are true. The higher you go, the lower the expected future return. You can gorge on your cake now or enjoy it piece by piece into the distant future, but you can't do both. The higher you go, the longer and the greater the pain you will have to endure to get back to trend. In the current case, to a trend value of 2,500 on the S&P 500, adjusted for the passage of time from whatever high point the market might reach. It is currently at 4,700. So he's saying that the trend value is somewhere around 2,500. So that would be almost 50% down from where we currently are, or at least that currently are at $4,700. Now, one of the things you should note with this is that he is looking at this as a grand, you know, looking at every single market and he's, he's making observations. And that's basically what his team does is they make allocations to where they think they can find the best value. Now, one of the other things that I wanted to mention too, is that when it comes to housing, one of the key points that he had in his letter was that the income to the price of housing is at astronomical values now. Now, this isn't normal in a well-working economy. I think what's happening right now, and we've kind of seen this, is that there's not enough housing for the amount of people that are trying to buy houses. And especially since over the last couple of years, we have had easy money. These people are now getting into housing because they're taking out 2%, 2.5%, 3% mortgages for 30 years. And in some cases, people were allowed to extend their mortgage past the 30 original 30 years. So we're having an issue where the demand is shooting up because the rates are so low. And obviously, if the supply is not there, it's going to drive prices higher and higher and higher. Now, they have to introduce more supply into this housing market. But the issue is the commodities are shooting up as well. As far as the commodities go, he's not too concerned in terms of a super bubble-esque uh, downfall. But what happens is, is as inflation increases and as commodity prices go up, think like food, um, you know, corn, any input that you have into food also, or livestock, as these things go up, what ends up happening is this hurts the little guy. This hurts the individual who's buying things and working wages and doesn't have any assets necessarily to their name. And this becomes an issue because you have the people who are driving growth in terms of buying things and consumerisms and all those things, they're not able to buy as much anymore. And next year, they're still not able to buy as much anymore. And wages aren't keeping up and there's inequality in the system where it's going top heavy in the system. This becomes more and more of an issue and it begins to compound because the problem is, is the people who are driving the growth, those smaller people, those individuals, are no longer able to keep up at the same amount of rates that we've seen over the last 20, 30, 40 years. And I think that in terms of commodities, especially as we've seen supply shortages and just disruptions because of the pandemic, this is going to normalize hopefully in the next couple of years. But does it normalize back to where we were in 2019 or does it normalize to where we are now? Meaning, does the inflation keep going, you know, forever or does it normalize at like 5 percent, 4 percent? Or does it stay at, you know, what 2019 was where we were averaging around 2%. It was honestly kind of hard for them to keep inflation at around 2% because 
there was so much technology innovation that things were driving down the price rather than actually increasing. So it's a weird issue, um, and it's something that they've wanted to touch on. Now, I was able to pull a graph just to kind of show you how far we are above trend lines. Now, this isn't from Jeremy's um, original letter that they sent out, but was something that I wanted to show you guys on a graph of how long this has been going on for. The article showed that the bull trend line was actually that bluish line. And the post-financial crisis lows was around that purple line. And these are trend lines um, that, you know, from different aspects. And I think that you can see that we've kind of been bouncing in between as we've been going up. But now we're starting to see a giant jump where value is this, this kind of grand, you know, grand line going up. But the actual stock prices are shooting up, and it's not following that trend line. It's not bouncing in between the trend lines. Instead, it's going way above. And I think a big portion of this has to do with the margin debt that we saw enter into the economy, and especially because rates were so low that people were able to take out loans and margin debt at little to no price. Really, in the aspect of inflation, it's basically not even you know you're not even losing money because the debt is being wiped away by the seven percent inflation we're seeing. So that is something that they wanted to point out as well. Now, going back to some of the points that he made, these are kind of just the overarching points that he had um, throughout his article, throughout his letter, and these are the excerpts. First, we are indeed participating in the broadest and most extreme global real estate bubble in history. Today, houses in the U.S. are at highest multiple of family income ever, after a 20% record gain last year ahead of even uh, the disastrous housing bubble of 2006. But although the U.S. housing market is selling at a high multiple of family income, it is less and sometimes far less than many other countries. He points out Canada, Australia, the U.K., and especially China. In China, real estate has played an unusually important and unique role in the extended boom and thereby poses a unique, equally unique risk to the economy and hence the rest of the world if its real estate market loses air exactly as it appears to be doing as we sit. Second, we have the most exuberant, ecstatic, even crazy investor behavior in the history of the United States stock market. The United States market today has, in my opinion, the greatest buy-in ever to the idea that stocks only go up, which is surely the real essence of a bubble. And you can see this if you were in the market back in February 2021. This was very evident. that A lot of people lost a lot of money just over the last couple of months. Um, as they thought that they hit the top or they thought that they, you know, to keep going up, they end up buying in at the wrong time. He said, interestingly, where other developed countries led in housing prices, they lag in the U.S. equity or they lag the U.S. in equity prices. Some such as Japan buy so much that they are merely slightly overpriced today. Third, as if this were not enough, we also have the highest priced bond market in the U.S. and most of the other countries around the world. The lowest rates, of course, and that go with them, that human history ha has ever seen. So this is talking about as rates go down, the yields and the price of the bonds are inverse. So as the rates go down, we're going to start seeing um, the yields sort of try to keep up with that. And then as we raise the federal funds rate, the um, bond prices will start to go down again. And this is the last piece. And for as gravy, we have broadly overpriced or above trend commodities, including oil and most of the other important metals. In LA, uh, gas is around 550, I think. So if that gives you an idea of where we're at. <laughs> um, in addition, the UN's index of global food prices is around all-time highs. These high prices are important as they push inflation and stress real incomes. The combination which we saw in 2008 of still rising commodity prices with the deflating asset price bubble is the ultimate pincer attack on the economy and is all but guaranteed to lead to major economic pain. Now, he really went on and talked about how how bad it was that AMC and GME and all the other meme stocks happened. And really, he just, just to point this out. So here are some anecdotes. The meme stock madness of GME and AMC, two companies in declining industries further decimated by COVID-19 that managed to rally 120 times and 38 times respectfully from the post-pandemic lows to their 2021 highs, driven by message board sentiment, taking GME briefly 20% to 20% of the entire Russell 2000. That's crazy. The Dogecoin phase in which a cryptocurrency conceived as a parody of the crypto craze went up nearly 300 times to a market cap of 90 billion because Elon Musk kept joking about it. And La Piste de Resistance, after Hertz, one of the 2020 meme stock stars saw a quick stock surge from announcing it would purchase a fleet of Teslas, Avis 
rather than plaintively said something like, hey dudes, we might buy electric cars too, and it tripled in a day. Now again, this goes back to where we're at right now. Um, and he just talks about on and on about how it's very scary to see this and how people shouldn't be doing this and this isn't the normal market. So he talks about the death of a vampire and he's talking about the market. In the meantime, we are in what I think of what I think of as the vampire phase of the bull market, where you throw everything you have at it, you stab it with COVID, you shoot it with the end of QE and quantitative easing, and the promise of higher rates, and you poison it with unexpected inflation, which has always killed PE ratios before, but quite uniquely, not this time, he said yet. Uh, and still the creature flies, just as it staggered through the second half of 2007, as its mortgage and other financial wounds increased one by one. Until just as you're beginning to think that things completely immortal is finally and perhaps a little anticlimactically keels over and dies. The sooner the better for everyone. And he's just pointing out that if prices remain at that value line, your returns in the future are going to be higher. As we drive prices up and as the stock prices keep flying higher and higher, this is going to mean lower and lower and lower returns. And Sven Carlin has a great videos uh, talking about this, and I think that it really just harps to the point that we have to be careful in this market when we're choosing the assets that we allocate our money into. So he also brought in sort of a model and GMO explaining the PE model and just sort of why it's so important. Um, and I'll just throw it up here, but there's a great correlation normally. And when this hasn't correlated or the correlation isn't following trend, it follows. You wait, it follows. Um, so again, the last thing that he really touched on here was perhaps the most important longer term negative of these three bubbles compressed in 25 years has been sustained pressure increasing inequality. And this is what I talked about earlier. To participate in the upside of an asset bubble, you need to own some assets. And the poor quarter of the public owns almost nothing. The top 1% in contrast own more than one third of all assets. And we can measure the rapid increase in inequality since 1997, which has left the US as the least equal of all rich countries. And even more shockingly, with the lowest level of economic mobility, even worse than that of the UK, at whom we used to laugh at a few decades back for its social and economic rigidity. This increase in inequality directly subtracts from broad-based consumption because on the margin, rich people getting richer will spend little to nothing of the increment where the poorest quartile would spend almost all of it. And he's talking about people spending all of their income. So if someone's making a million dollars, they're not going to necessarily spend all a million versus someone who's making $20,000, $30,000, $40,000 a year, they're going to have to spend that entire amount. Um, said, so here we are again, this time with world record stimulus from the housing bus days, followed by ineffably massive stimulus from COVID. Some of it, of course, necessary, just how much of it revealed at a later date. But everything has consequences, and the consequences this time may or may not include some intractable inflation. But it has already definitely included the most dangerous breadth of asset overpricing in financial history. At some future date, when pessimism rules again, as it does from time to time, asset prices will decline. And if valuations across all of these asset classes return even two thirds of the way back to its historical norms, total wealth losses will be an, on the order of $35 trillion in the US alone. If this negative wealth and income effect is compounded by inflationary pressures from energy, food, and other shortages, we will have some serious economic problems on our hands. Now, that's the end of his letter as far as things that I wanted to go through and just sort of some closing thoughts that I wanted to end on. If you're going to be getting into this market and for some reason this video popped up on your feed, if you're going to be getting in this market, make sure whatever you're paying for, whatever company you're trying to buy, make sure you A, understand the economics of the business, how they make money, how they'll lose money, what the upside is, and realistically what the risks are of investing into this business. There are some companies where they look like they're good value and they might end up being value traps, meaning it looks good value, but that's because there's something underlying that we're going to miss. And obviously, over time, you will miss some companies. That's totally fine. But let's say if you can get three out of five companies or seven out of 10, six out of 10, you're going to be good over the long term. So I think, though, as far as what we can do as investors today, the important thing is you need to invest into companies that have large moats that control a lot of assets that are growing that have earnings power and have pricing power where they can 
There's a lot of companies, that, and one that comes ahead is Starbucks. They're able to raise their prices in an economy and in an environment where coffee is going up, all the inputs for their uh, company as a whole is going up. Think salaries, um, plastic, coffee, any of the other commodities that they use. All of that's going up, and the CEO came and said, we can raise our prices and people will still buy it. You wanna buy into companies like that, but you wanna do it at a fair or good price. You wanna make sure that you're getting enough value and leave yourself a margin of safety when you're investing. Again, if you invest in companies like Palantir, I don't know who else, Palantir, Tesla, or any of these crazy hype stocks, you're gonna get hurt more often than not. And that's not to say that these individual companies won't be bad, but it's the style of investing, that formula that you build, that process that you're using, that will end up hurting you in the end because you're gonna hit on one of those companies and think you can do it again and again and again until one day you over, you know, you're overconfident, you put way too much money in a company and you lose all that money in the long term. Now, I know this isn't the, you know, the most exciting video. This was probably was a lot, not nearly as exciting as it could have been, but it's something that I wanted to bring up because I think it's important that you understand where we are currently today. Now, if you're like me, I'm watching the retail space. There's a lot of low PE or low multiple companies that are in the consumer cyclical space, but I'm looking at the macroeconomics and seeing how the consumer spending is being affected. Because I'm thinking student loans, mortgages, and other things are going to affect how people spend in the back half of this year. And inflation really is one of those big components that I'm looking at as well. But let me know what you guys think down below. If you're interested in this kind of talk or going through letters, getting through some thoughts, or if you guys want to see more stocks that I can do some reviews on, let me know down in the comments below. I've been picking up one company that I'll hopefully do a video on maybe in the next couple of weeks and kind of go through it. Um, I just want to make sure I get all my thoughts before I actually come out with the video. But anyways, guys, thank you all for joining. Remember to like and subscribe. Have a great day, y'all.